So thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about our recent uh, project where we uh, reintroduced some of the Northern River Terrapin uh, back in the wild in India. So uh, before I start, uh, I must uh, mention that I am going to present this on behalf of Turtle Survival Alliance as well as Sundarban Tiger Reserve of West Bengal Forest Department. Since these two organizations have been working tirelessly closely for long, long uh, 12 to 14 years to bring this species back from the extinction. And this project is very, very close to my heart and I'm really, really, very ple pleased to share some of the findings of this project with you guys uh, today. So well, I mean, people who don't know about Turtle Survival Alliance, so we around the world uh, always work with three pronged conservation action approaches. So first is to restore the wild populations and also means you know, make sure that populations are still remain thriving in the wild. Also secure a species in the captivity through assurance colonies, conservation colonies, as well as head start colonies. So we have sufficient number of animals in the captivity in case of any exigencies. And we also build the capacity to restore, secure, and conserve a species within their range country and especially means you know, with uh, various stakeholders. So this is our three-pronged approach uh, wherever we are working right now throughout the globe to recover and save different species of endangered turtles. So introducing a uh, Northern River Terrapin. So this species is like uh, the people who know about freshwater turtles. So we have more than 300 plus species of freshwater turtles and tortoises throughout the world. And this is most critically endangered species in India, as well as possibly in Bangladesh as well. And uh, this species is very charismatic. As you can see, this is like a male in the new petal color. And, uh, and, and this is like largest turtles, one of the largest turtles in the entire South Asia. So uh, as I said, that means, you know, this like males and females, as you can see the difference here, they are sexually dimorphic. Males are much bigger and they means, you know, definitely exhibit different other different traits, like means, you know, the, 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 the male's tail is longer than the females, uh, among other things. And during breeding season, the color you, you can see right now is the color of the male are definitely enhanced and they express jet black head and reddish pink skin. And this is like one of the most beautiful turtles means, you know, I have seen throughout my life. Uh, so female nest on the sea facing beaches uh, and river sandbars. Females lay up to 30 eggs per clutch. And generally means you know, all this nesting, the courtship happens sometime October, right, right after the monsoon, October and November. And then female lays uh, early March and uh, hatchlings, which I'm going to show you in a little bit, hatchlings emerge in early May to uh, late May. So no, why Northern River Terrapin is important before just like getting into that, we should definitely understand their ecosystem and the habitat they inhabited means, you know, about hundred years back, means, you know, they were through and through. So this species is very, very unique in terms of the ecology and they use from fresh water to the mangrove system and also they went all the way to the sea facing islands. I mean, almost in saline water to nest. So they connected almost three different uh, ecosystems and you know, they, they utilize the entire mangroves. So babies, whenever they has their means you know, down close to the sea beaches, they always came up uh, and also means you know, went further up and up and they use different foraging areas. So this is very, very kind of a tightly intact with the entire uh, health of uh, mangroves. And means you know, none of the species as I can remember means you know, that used in, especially in non-marine uh, non uh, turtles or terrapins means you know, they use like uh, this vast ecosystem which means you know, had like three or four, or maybe like more, much more than that different components. 
So when you talk about Sundarbans a little bit, so uh, I mean, you should definitely be knowing about the tigers. So tiger is in landscape is like kind of a umbrella species. And uh, in Indian parts of the Sundarban, which is just one fourth of the entire Sundarbans, as like tiger are about close to 100 as per the recent estimates. And then the, this, this, this place is also inhabited by saltwater crocodile, which is another apex predator of the aquatic ecosystem. And unfortunately, means so there are some uh, issues with the human and uh, tigers and human and crocodiles and about like both uh, in Bangladesh Sundarban as well as in Indian Sundarbans, about 20 to 25 people, this is just a mean number, are attacked by the tigers and saltwater crocodiles. So Sundarban is entirely a kind of a mosaic of uh, rivers and uh, wetlands and uh, channels and uh, you know islands so it's like there's you no know, very very difficult terrain so northern river terrapin which we call now as a ghost of mangroves as you can see here in this map so this is the farmer range as you can see this entire yellow thing so they were abundant in eastern india bangladesh and western myanmar and the thing was that before 2007, we thought that means, you know, river terrapin, uh, I mean, there was one species of river, river terrapin exist. And the, we were like, means, you know, including all the partners, conservation partners, including different governments were like slightly uh, convenient. Then still we have good populations in Thailand and, you know, other parts of the, parts of the South East Asia. But uh, from uh, some of the work which said Northern River Terrapin is a different species, there were definitely means you no know, kind of urgent con conservation attention was required to understand that means you know, how many populations are still surviving. So as you can see, that means you know, adults and eggs, those were hunted to excess in, uh, during the past two countries, uh, two centuries. And they were everywhere. I mean, like it's not only in India, but in Bangladesh and wherever they were. I mean, like especially, I mean, the, the coastal region of Orissa, where like you know, once they were abundant in rivers like Suvarnarekha and all of that, they were there. But as as part of our initial surveys in year two thousand seven and eight and a part of nine, also I myself did not encounter a single specimen anywhere in any market or, or, or field site or anything. People have been saying that means you know, they have seen this species in the markets maybe 10 years back, the last one and stuff. And the people we interviewed, they were really, really, I mean, kind of a knowledgeable since fishermen, those grew up means you know, in the tidal ecosystem, definitely have lots of ethnic knowledge and also understanding about the turtles, not only this turtle, but also other turtles and, and other aquatic wildlife. TSN partners may you know, estimated uh, 20 individuals persist across their range. So a few years back, there was, uh, there was an incident where we found a couple of individuals, a couple of hatchlings in Bangladesh. And that's all. I think that's only the wild encounter of any, uh, any, any specimen so far in last 10, 10 to 12 years of the project. And again, Fifth, uh, for fourth point, as you can see, that means you know, last wild nesting occurred on one of the major island uh, in on uh, the, which is called Mechua in India. That was mid 1990s. So, and since then, there was no such record of any nesting emergence and or any hatching uh, as per uh, the record of like you know any government or non-government organization anywhere means you know, in the country. And this species is uh, ranked uh, currently critically endangered by IUCN Red List of threatened species. But critically endangered does not do the full justice. As you can see, that means when there are only 20 individuals left in the wild. Those are means, you know, those may have been surviving, and we don't know uh, much about them. And this is the current range. That's like very narrow range. And possibly only the Sundarbans of India and Bangladesh is a last wild uh, range of this species, you know, which is still have the hope to recover the species from the brink. So in the recent years, as I said, that only few animals are cited and only juveniles as already mentioned, and at least so that indicated that at least one female successfully reproduced. And uh, we, 
uh, both, I mean, our Bangladesh counterparts led by Vienna Zoo and uh, Turtle Survival Alliance in India and partners, uh, Sundarban Tiger Reserve, we did everything to find that any record of like, you know, any such nesting or any such like other wild uh, specimen, but we could not get any. So uh, that warranted an immediate action to save this species from the extinction uh, in 2008. So here's some photo from the initial days. As you can see, uh, this is me here down when I found the first captive population of, like little population of 12 individuals in a pond in Sajna Khali, which is like kind of a main entrance of uh, Indian Sundarban. And uh, I mean, thanks to one of the records in the forest department office, we suggested that they're like, so there was a, a little hatching with like olive ridley turtle and the animals were the whatever uh, hatchling emerged from those uh, nests they were slightly different than the sea turtles but that record also did not say that where they were actually released so and that indicated that means you no know, they may have been released either in bagna or in sundarbans so i started just like looking for and fishing those ponds and thanks to forest department again for all the permissions and help and uh, cooperation to you know uh, so i was i was able to look in these ponds and uh, ascertain that still there is a like little population of uh, 13 individuals are still surviving so 12 was adults and one was still juvenile and i was so very excited when i first encountered those those heads were popping in one of those ponds in sajna khali so that was like kind of like really really very big moment for me and I immediately went back to Kolkata, which is like administrative headquarter for the West Bengal Forest Department. And the state wildlife director sits there. We call him chief wildlife warden for the permit that, sir, I mean, I definitely need to fill that pond and understand that if there is any turtle or how many turtles are there. So since I was confirmed, there are turtles, but I re definitely wanted to know that how many turtles were still surviving. And uh, they just permitted me to, so I came back, I faced all the turtles in presence of the officers and, you know, we gendered them. So by that way, we knew that, okay, there is still hope. So uh, we started, uh, as I said, the 12 adult terrapins were discovered in 2008. So we just like kept it very low profile, all the work. And we thought that means, you know, probably this cohort came from the last nest, which was like some sometime mid 1990s. And uh, we started improving the diet. And uh, I mean, definitely means, you know, there, uh, before there was no scientific management for this species for any conservation breeding or stuff. So we added basking and nesting platforms and whatever conducive environment we knew from a closely related species or other sister species, uh, uh, Southern River Terrapin Batagura finis. So we, whatever learning was there means, you no, know, we used that learning. We kept it low profile, kept it very simple, very logical uh, ponds, as you can see in the bed, no concrete, nothing. Just like we modified the earthen ponds to start a breeding program. And again, I mean, uh, Sundarban Tiger Reserve, in spite of all their, uh, um, all their uh, engagement with like uh, big tigers and crocodiles and animal conflict and things like that, they provided all the support to the team uh, to so we can uh, do something with this species so this uh, uh, this 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 project used those uh, five females as the founders and rest were males so this very interesting thing happened in the beginning so first few years we did not get any any nest to say and but and we did not have any means to do the x-ray or anything ultrasound to understand that means you know, if there is like calcified eggs or something but I, I guess that you know, animals or females especially were still maturing. And there's another thing I noticed from this populations that uh, when released together, most of the males were still chasing females. So females were like slightly disturbed. They were not able to you know, emerge and nest and stuff. So that's one thing we did. We removed most of the females, uh, most of the males from the breeding enclosure. And we started calling like, you know, a kind of a little enclosure, we used that. And so that was kind of a maternity ward. So right before the nesting in 2012, we shifted all five females from the main enclosure to that little concrete enclosure. And the uh, very first time in 2012, I mean, there was like 30, 33 hatchlings emerged, which I'm going to show you in a little bit. 
So this is like, uh, I mean, and then again, we were, uh, this was again turning point of the entire project that after like so much efforts in the permitting and everything and understanding the, the, the you know, the cohort size and the sex ratio that what you need to do. So there's a very first time we found this, uh, uh, this, these animals, those hazed in, in the facility and they were 33 in number. So, you know, we kind of celebrated together that, okay, now, I think that there's a further hope that we can again bring this species back and they are not gone yet. So uh, in last 10 years, the program together has more than 370 uh, terrapins. So it's like very, very proud thing for us. And they are distributed among seven colonies uh, throughout Sundarban Tiger Reserve and they're breeding the breeding facility is under construction in Sundarban Biosphere Reserve as well. So probably there would be eight such conservation colonies going to be created very, very soon. So program is now the second largest uh, in the world for recovering the Northern River Terrapin. So Batagur Baska program in Bangladesh, which is like definitely leading the way. And they have more than 400 animals in their captive facility, mainly centered at Karamjal. So as you can see, that means when these are the growing hatchlings. So just like, you know, we put some photos to give you some understanding that how they, how they develop the color and how they look when they are young. So as you can see that means, you know, this, this, and now like means when they are grow, uh, they are grown in like different, I mean, especially designed grow out facilities. And again, they are very, very simple. We prefer earthen ponds. And now since we are moving in phase two, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, uh, so now we started like thinking that we definitely we need to work on more concrete based grow out facilities where we can do some studies, especially on eco tolerance and, uh, you know, other things like temperature sex determination and all of that. But uh, otherwise, we kept everything very, very simple and low cost across from the Brent Tiger Reserve. So turtles are fed with well, well varied omnivorous diet. So they like to eat everything. So, but right now their diet consists uh, shrimp, uh, whole face, and there's no different kind of like, you know, pumpkin, they, they really like pumpkin and also banana and different things and also ipomia. So all these things means, you know, they are fed as, as you can see that means, you no, know, thankfully they, are, they look very, very healthy and they gain weight, whatever means no, we want them to be. So that's again, I mean, that indicates that they are on proper and balanced diet. Uh, so Turtle Survival Alliance, especially the international team uh, of uh, veterinarians and also forest department, local veterinarian, those are stationed at the park. They perform routine health assessment, which is very, very important since we can't afford losing a single animal from this population. So. I mean, I'm extremely happy the way like veterinarians are helping and, you know, and they are also engaged with the conservation work. So uh, there is a veterinarian, uh, Dr. Sankar Biswas. So he's, he's been very, very helpful. And whenever I go there, I always find him with our team, with turtle team more than the tiger team or doing any administrative work. So if other veterinarians are listening this talk, so I definitely means, you know, try and appeal them that they should be also helping the local turtle conservation or conservation of less unknown fauna. So that's sometimes it's very, very helpful for the team which is working with low cost. So uh, coming back to the release, so how like we thought, so after nine years or other 10 years of like, you know, or other, yeah, nine years of the uh, total conservation breeding. So we started moving forward with the concept of, you know, release and reintroduction program. So sub-adults were moved. So we dug a facility uh, there means you no know, much closer to the uh, core zone of the park. And this, this facility was kind of also we, so when you keep the animals with in an assisted facility, so they might get the human imprints. And if you feed them, uh, you know, at a certain time, so they come and beg for food and things like that. So we just wanted to reduce that. And also means you know, most of the time animals were in the fresh water ponds. So we wanted to take them to the different salinity gradient. And in that uh, situation means, you know, we uh, thought that it would be a good idea if we create a soft lease pen. Since it's again, very, very hard to put a soft lease pen inside 
inside the park. Since again, when there's a tidal effect and there is a very, very hard to monitor due to the tigers and crocodiles. And also they are, everything is like storms are very, very unpredictable. Uh, so there, so it's like, uh, uh, so we thought that probably means you know, we start with like inland facility which has a higher salinity level and then animals are disconnected from the direct human care. So we did this facility close to Jila and there's another uh, range station. Sorry, the spelling is spelled wrong here, but otherwise the place is called Jila and 28 animals was transferred to, uh, about two years back before the actual release. And they stayed here uh, with the uh, minimum human care. And they were definitely provided food and everything, but we did not really disturb them. And they were like, you know, that this place was huge, but this photo does not do justice with the entire place, but this place was really, really huge. And uh, one very interesting thing that we had to carry, especially the Sundarban Tiger Razor had to carry a whole big JCB on the board to take this place. So, and uh, as already discussed, that means no. Uh, so when we started preparing for release, so as you can see, so we did after, uh, um, yes, uh, so, um, a storm came last year during May. So we did the entire health assessment of like, you know, all the batches, including this batch, which were getting ready to be released. And at that point, all of you uh, must be aware, aware that this, this, I mean, the Corona situation was everywhere and at the same time there was a year. So it was very difficult situation. And then we were still awaiting our permission. So we had to take a special permission since this area, a proposed area of release uh, that fell uh, as part of like, some part was like kind of international border between India and Bangladesh. So we were very sure to get the necessary permission and authorizations and paperwork in order before we actually go back and release the animals in the wild. So while we were waiting for all those permissions, we did like comprehensive health assessment after just, and uh, 10 sub-adults, those were uh, selected for us from the soft lease habitat actually to be released back in the wild. And selected turtles were given thorough health examinations, including disease screening and assessment of overall fitness. And most of the turtles, when we selected them, were uh, especially females were more than 10 kilogram and males were uh, more than eight kilograms. So they can carry the transmitters on their back and transmitters not like really a big thing for them. So, I mean, just to understand the body ratio and the transmitter weight and things like that. So turtle shell was cleaned, as you can see that so there's a deputy director of the park, Mr. Jones Justin was a very young officer and being very, very dynamic and supportive to all our work for past one year. He was, um, he was, he joined in uh, uh, right before uh, Yas came. So it's like kind of a very new experience for him. And since then he's speaking very, very fast and you know, he's very, very interested in the entire turtle conservation. And uh, down you can see uh, my colleagues, Sripanna Datta as well as Pawan Parikh. So they are preparing an individual for release, uh, 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 release in the wild. So turtle shells were cleaned and then they were prepared for affixing the tra satellite and VHF transmitters. There were not two transmitters, there was one transmitter, but they had a different, uh, they had different components inbuilt within the system. So as you can see a closer photo that how we fix the transmitter. So we learned some from the sea turtle work and also we further, but we, what we did not do, we did not put an antenna in our transmitter. Uh, I thought that means, you know, it would be really good if this transmitter is going to be without antenna. So, uh, so that does not entangle in the fishing net, as well as we further secured it, not only with the epoxy, but as you can see that means, you know, fiberglass mess and the visible contact information that is being very, very helpful of like, you know, Turtle Survival Alliance Aquatic Helpline, as well as West Bengal Forest Department was given under the epoxy. So still people can read it, but that is not, uh, that is not wet when turtles are swimming or turtles are there out in the wild. And also this transmitter does not hurt the turtles or hinder their movement. As you can see, this is a very standard method that how you put the transmitters on the turtle back.
So this is the vast system, as you can see, I mean, like, you know, it's more than 10,000 square kilometers, like really, really vast. And this picture again does not do justice how the, I mean, people who been there in Sundarbans, it's like water everywhere and then islands and the mangroves. So, you know, the, it's, it's like very unpredictable that where whatever animals you're going to release, where they're going to go. So uh, our partners in Bangladesh, they released some turtles uh, possibly in 20, late 2018, and they showed the great, uh, uh, their movement, like so they showed the uh, great uh, movement distances. So, I mean, some of the, they, they've been very, very helpful also teaching us that what happened with them, but they released uh, wild caught or captive meals rather than, uh, you know, had started animals back in the wild, probably they are preparing now. So this is how we work with Bangladesh program. So they do one thing and we learn from that. And then we just follow them and correct whatever, you know, challenges are there already. So uh, uh, satellite transmitter allowed TSC to track the annual turtle movements when they surface. So this is how it was programmed. So every day, three GPS coordinates, this transmitter can pick, okay. If, but provided uh, turtles should surface for enough time. And as you can see, there's the highest body point of the turtle. So this would definitely mean you no know, surface for that, as well as the VHF transmitter was on between 10 to four uh, during the day. So we thought that probably turtles are going to come out and maybe basking at some point of the time. And then we go out on the small boards and probably just get some signals. So, uh, so we did not get any signal so far. I will come to that in a minute. But VHF transmitter that helps you to zero down when, uh, where like, you know, animal can go and how, why they are staying, what are the habitat features or why they are just like using that particular area. So that means that means, you know, that, that we call that clusters. So the clusters are very important. That means animals are using that area frequently. So this is the, with that uh, vision, we actually integrated VHF transmitter with our satellite tags. So another thing we did that right after we tagged all the animals, so we took all the animals to the nearest Bon Bibi temple. That's a very, very interesting story and myths and beliefs with the, uh, so, I mean, Bon Bibi is the goddess of forest and both Hindu and Muslims, they equally revere Bon Bibi, both Indian and, and Bangladesh parts of the Sundarban. So we did like a, a little function where we took all our animals to our nearest Bon Bibi temple and invited the locals, especially the fishermen in that area. Since everyone just like gathers there uh, uh, twice a year to pray Bon Bibi. And there's a belief that means, you know, if after you should be entering the forest, then forest is considered very dangerous due to the tigers and crocodiles. So before entering the forest, you should definitely pray Bon Bibi. And, and, and that is going to save you from any such unwanted attacks from like, you know, any, any wild animal. So, and, and then people uh, as like, you know, people are really, really connected with, with, with that culture. So we thought it'd be really great idea to take all our animals and get them blessed uh, from Bon Bibi. So, and then we invited priests and some of the locals, especially the fishermen, those who are there in that vicinity. And also so that helped us to send a message across since all the fishermen are connected and they know that uh, what's happening and you know, in the park in terms of tigers and everything. So it was, so we thought that probably taking opportunity to, you know, send a word and also means, you know, take them in, the, in our confidence that they should be knowing that what is being done and how this particular species is integral part of their own uh, culture and, and, and the ecosystem and how that connected the entire ecosystem and represented the health of entire mangroves, uh, I mean, before a couple of hundred years. So... And this is some of the close up. This is our priest, as you can see, he's praying our lead girl. So we named all the turtles. So she is our lead girl, Kali. So she is being prayed. And she was also curious that what is happening. And as you can see, that uh, our researcher and the forest department people, as, as well as like, you know, the community members, those are sitting in the back. 
and everyone was very happy and you know being involved with everything uh, that we were doing and they really wished well the turtles those were returning back in the wild so essentially means so these turtles were born bb stample so we thought that means so no one if they are going to get entangled in the fishing nets or anything is going to harm them so that was the whole idea so that for the release, we traveled overnight from the soft lease location in the big boats you are going to see in one of those pictures. And uh, all the turtles were secured in, uh, in the gunny sacks and they were, uh, I mean, hydrated through the way and they were not given any food for like at least eight to 10 hours before the trans transportation. And all the big offices came, as you can see that means so even uh, 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 the state chief or a warden was scheduled to come, but he could not come due to there was some Corona and probably he was infected. But other than means you know, all the offices and this was like this in the peak Corona season when my Micron virus was kind of hitting India's like, you know, door. So everyone was like so very uh, kind of skeptical due to the uh, virus, but still people participated in the release. So uh, this is like everyone, the entire release team, as you can see here, it's very hard to just like name everyone, but, and then there's a very interesting uh, thing you, you can see in the back, there are two uniform guards, they are standing. So they are actually uh, saving us from the tiger attack. So essentially when you just like look other side or tiger come from the back and can take you. So all the uniform guard in the back. So uh, they are just like saving us from the any tiger attack. So uh, this was done in mid-January uh, 2022 and release represented first monitor rewilding of Northern River Terrapin and any first satellite tagging of non-marine turtles in India. Before that, they did some Olive Ridley release and stuff from uh, in down south and Orissa coast and rec very recently uh, close to Mumbai. But uh, this is like first for any non-marine turtles. And so everyone was very excited knowing that. And uh, uh, definitely means you know, it's kind of, a, and it was, as I already mentioned that they taking all the permissions, my team members, including uh, Arpita Datta and Rishika Dubla and everyone, they were just like running pillar to pole to get like all the paperwork in order um, under the supervision of Sundarban Tiger Reserve and West Bengal Forest Department. So uh, that that like you know the whole thing now their doors open there are lots of officers know that how that does that happen and why you need to put transmitter or especially satellite transmitter on any turtles and how it is going to save them from how it's going to save them from uh, you know being extinct so that's like kind of a very great start I would say in spite of like you know really really long uh, wait of two years. <laughs> So as you can see that, so we let the turtles go in the morning and the boat you can see in the background, this is how turtles were brought and again on the smaller boats. And then means, you know, we just like, you know, walk through the mud and just like put them just like very soft mud and just like put them on the land to go back. And to start with, they were very, very confused since, you know, you can see this entire vast uh, river and you know so all the green stuff and everything so they were kind of a that where you are you guys are leaving us what we are going to do types so more photos so this is like kind of a uh, so this is a lead girl Kali so she was one who was uh, leading the pack so we named all our turtles you know, um, uh, I mean we gave everyone a human name just to connect so people all the fishermen everyone just like connected and it's like also a uh, great thing to tell rather than just numbers. So, and then Kali in a minute, I'm going to show you that how she moved after being released at this location. And she was just like sitting here and waiting and looking. She was very confused at where I am and what I'm going to do and stuff. And once they were all released in the water, she just like kind of came back and she was just like hanging close to edge for some time and they were like, you know, we were moving back. We thought let's like, let them disperse and we'll come back in a few hours and start tracking them. So they were kind of a little bit followed the boat. So they thought that probably like, you know, they were just, that was like very emotional point, which we thought that means, you know, it's like, you know, very, it was very, very emotional. So for community engagement, so we did a couple of things. So before the release, 
So all the licensed fish are we selected some of the locations. Those are very important and strategic within the Sundarban Tiger Reserves for the community engagement and awareness programs. And we went there and, uh, um, and then especially Mr. Jones, who's a deputy director, he also took a special interest and we all traveled together in, in, in rickshaws, in bikes and in boats and just like try and inform everyone that turtles are uh, going to come back in the, in the system. And so, so, and then there was only one appeal from all the fishermen and everyone who used to go to the forest that if they see any turtle, so without any fear, they can just pass on that information to us. So we still think it's very, very important to involve the communities, especially the fishermen, those travel long distances, it stays in boats for days. So this is one of the houseboats, uh, my colleague Upmanyu, so he's like, he's been tracking, he's been involved full time with this. So yeah, so Upmanyu, uh, so what we did, we just like, you know, uh, kind of, we took some of the locations, those are strategic. We thought that fisherman is going to travel long distances and do the fishing. So we thought it would be a great idea to talk to them and inform them about this release. And if any turtle accidentally get caught, so probably they are going to, uh, you know, be immediately inform us about. And also Upmanyu took a special effort and he made uh, lots of fishermen on the way aware while we were tracking the animals or before release that look, this is what we did. And if anything, not only the uh, release turtles, but any wild turtles, if you see, so please report back to us and that would be very valuable information. So almost everyone, those are, uh, you know, those have been fishing and uh, in, in, in that system, they were kind of, we tried to involve them. And we thought that means you know, in due course of time, that is going to be, be very important for us to initiate a community monitoring for in such a vast ecosystem. So this is a little poster we did in Bangla with little appeal that why they should not, why the fishermen should not fear and report uh, any turtle sighting or any turtle entanglement. And even they can hand over the transmitters to us. And also like, you know, we will reward them if like turtles return to us unharmed. So that was very, very important thing to start with. Also, fishermen found it very amusing, uh, the names and uh, everything since you know, all the names were from Bengali culture, of course. So they found us very, very like connecting to, you know, help us support and while returning this species back in the wild. And uh, to our surprise, I mean, everyone wants to see like, you know, that since the species is like part of their culture and part of like, they have been seeing, especially the old fishermen, they have been seeing like lots of Batagut Baska in their, uh, in their time, especially while fishing in the deeper Sundarbans. So everyone was very supportive to this. And I will come to that in a minute. That means you know, how this really helped us while monitoring this species, especially in Bangladesh parts of Sundarbans. So again, uh, Upmanyu is talking to the locals and especially the women, those are visiting our facilities. So we always make a point that we let them know that what is happening here. It's not like just a couple of freaks are breeding turtles, but this is how, like what, what is the eventual goal and end point and how everyone's support is needed to bring this species back from the extinction. So the eventual idea is again, as I already mentioned a couple of times is to bring everyone on board and make this program fully inclusive. So especially local people help support this. So where all the turtles go after we release them. So as I said, that means when they were like kind of a look slightly confused to start with, they were going down, they were diving down and coming back up like kind of her that, oh, it was too deep for us since they have been there. I mean, though our ponds are very deep, it's like more, most of the ponds are more than six, seven feet or eight feet sometime, but these this, this waters are really, really deep. I mean, I would say some, some of the waters are like about 30 feet, 40 feet, it's like, and so when you can just like row, I mean, uh, uh, row the big ship, so you 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 get an idea that how deep some of the sections are. So they were, I mean, to start with, they were slightly confused, but then they started settling in a uh, couple of days, and that was very very uh, pleasing to see them that how they were dispersing and how they started eating and stuff like that. So the great dispersal, as you can see, and that so this is the today's result right before my presentation started. Upmanyu sent from Sundarbans directly. 
So a few days back, it was 6,000 kilometers, the maximum area they covered. And as already mentioned, the total Sundarban is 10,000 kilometers. And now they already, I mean, all the, uh, you know, all the dots, if you link, so their total 9,000 km square kilometer, they already dispersed from each other. So out of 10 turtles, we are getting signal from uh, seven turtles right now. And two males are not sending the signal, but we are very hopeful that they are going to send the signals very soon. So some turtle moves moved about 300 kilometers in just first days. And as you can see in point number three, that 18 kilometers per day. So some turtles like, you know, 18 kilometers, they just like kept going. And our monitoring team was just like, they have to return uh, to the base every day. But we when we started analyzing the satellite data, so that was not like really possible to match with that movement. And, uh, you know, so they don't need to return back to any any place per se every day. So they just like kept going and going. So uh, again, so this is Kali, a lead girl, uh, Terrapin A15, as you can see the moment, sorry, yeah, my, my cursor is not working, but uh, no, it's not working. So, uh, but the blue dot, uh, oh, sorry, yellow dot, you can see steam left, that was a release site and she went back all the way down in few days time and she stayed a little bit in the sea. And then again, she further came up and used one of the secondary channel. And then she took the same path, came back again and been in the sea again. And then so she had been swinging the movement toward up toward more toward Bangladesh and going again up, as you can see, just like entire Bangladesh she passed. And right now she had the fringe of the uh, Bangladesh parts of the Sudarman. So last location was 7th of March, as you can see in the top extreme left, uh, extreme right up. So there's a great movement uh, she sowed and she already, I believe, moved uh, 464 kilometers from the actual release. So it's like, I mean, we were completely overwhelmed with the, you know, the, 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 the movement they sowed in uh, last six to seven weeks. So this is Kesto, our male, who uh, the release site, and he was like, I think the less traveled male. So as you can see, there's just 40, kilo, 40 kilometer and last signal was, but since then he did not send any signal. And we are waiting for iridium reports to be generated from this uh, specimen and really waiting uh, to see some, some of the interesting movements. So, uh, I mean, I have lost more maps and things, but uh, in the interest of time, I can't show you more, but yeah, so shortly we will put a kind of comprehensive report on our website as well as on uh, forest department website. So you can see that how they move. And also this information is slightly to start with this like kind of a little uh, classified. So, uh, before I go back to that, so the recent update that uh, out of like seven animals, the four animals are sending signals from Bangladesh, or rather they sent signals from Bangladesh, and two animals were rescued. They, were, they, they entered in the fishing zone, and they were rescued by the Bangladesh Forest Department. And though the transmitters from those animals were detached and now they're at the Karamjal Center, but fortunately both transmitters and the animals were saved. But still two more animals are there. And in one of those incidences, um, an animal was captured as again, that was released back. So that information came, came today. So uh, a few days back uh, on, I mean, this Monday itself, uh, so, uh, Turtle Survival Alliance and Sundarban Tiger Reserve together made a vision plan in the for next uh, 10 years. And there, one of the major component that we have to definitely extend more support and awareness for the fishermen, more support for the park rangers in the Bangladesh parts. And both program need to work in more close collaborations and we need to be having uh, better dialogue system so and or other information system that means what is happening. And so probably they can help us in a better way. And so we really hope that means you know, all these animals are going to explore this entire uh, Sundarban and we get like, you know, lots more information on the survivals and dispersal. And it will be really, really interesting to see that how they are going to ho be homing and where they are going to be settled and what they are going to and other natural history information. So, uh, I mean, uh, till now we are getting lots of great information and all those animals, those were saved in Bangladesh. They were not due to our location, but just with a little idea of just putting the phone number on the shell. And they, 
made all the efforts. I mean, Bangladesh fishermen made all the efforts, including Bangladesh police made all the efforts to contact their Indian counterparts. They contacted TSA and STR offices. And we were just like able to guide them that how, what you should do and stuff. But some curious fishermen removed those transmitters, but they did not destroy it. So all, the, all this cooperation and everything, so everyone is excited and we just want all the excitement to be more collective in nature so we can together save this uh, species. It's not just like India or Bangladesh or any country per se, but everyone just we need all the hands on the take right now to save this species from extinction. So I think uh, I'm good for now. I think 55 minutes I already took and, but I quickly mention all my uh, donors and collaborators and partners. So especially Sundarban Tiger Reserve and Ministry of Environment and Forest, uh, West Bengal Forest Department, they've been very, very supportive, all the officers and uh, leadership of the program. There are certain uh, donors like Ocean Park, Hong Kong, People Trust for Endangered Species. They have been just like supporting Turtle Survival Alliance and buying all those equipments. And during the Corona period, I mean, like whenever we asked extension, they always provided extension, they understood the Indian system. So we sincerely thank all our donors, collaborators and partners, and especially our uh, TSA India staff, which, uh, have been just like helping. It's not just my work, it's like work of everyone. It's like a small group of biologists, especially Shri Pranath Datta, Pawan Parikh, Rishika Dubla, Arpita Datta, and uh, Upmanyu, and uh, all the back, back end staff of like, you know, Sundarban Tiger Reserve, uh, lots of keepers, I can't name them off, lots of lots of officers and everyone. So, I mean, it's a collective project. It's a model project between communities, uh, non-government conservation organizations and a uh, government organizations where everyone was transparent to each other. And that is the reason we accomplished what we accomplished till date. And I'm really, really very hopeful that we are going to accomplish more in the second phase as part of the vision planning for this species recovery, which is very, very ambitious vision plan where we want to put, uh, I mean, create a uh, ecological, uh, ecologically fun, uh, viable colony, uh, uh, ecological viable population within the tiger reserve and putting more and more animals back since again, it's a vast ecosystem and probably 10 animals are not going to make much effort, but it's just a pilot uh, program. And that will help us to guide, to set up a, I mean, uh, ecological or establish ecologically viable population within the park. So that's all from my side. For, this evening. Thanks so much, Shai. That's it was a great presentation and inspiring work. I know this project means so much to you and to the TSA India program, as well as to the Sunderbonds Tiger Reserve and the Sunderbonds National Park and West Bengal Forest Department. And of course, in uh, basically making a whole of the uh, binational effort between Bangladesh and India. And for us at TSA, this is just incredible work. It's more than a decade in the making, and it's so exciting to see where we go from here. So that being said, I hope everyone stays around for the next several minutes because there are numerous questions that have been asked through the Q&A. Shai, I'm going to read them aloud to you so that uh, so that you're able to not only see them, but so then everyone can hear them as well. So our first question is from Sonia. Sonia asks, sir, what was the primary cause of extreme depletion of the population from its natural habitat in the beginning? Was it purely anthropogenic or even ecosystem changes that had a part to play? So Sonia, thank you for the question, but I think it was selective hunting since it's a, one of the largest hard cell turtles in, in the entire South Asia as already mentioned. And that that was the like, you know, people try and, you know, seek something big. So I would say the selective hunting that was later joined by other things. Like I was mentioning the habitat integrity and all of that. I mean, especially uh, pollutions in some of the systems like Suvarnarekha and the complete like destruction of such rivers. So to start with, yes, it's like, I think that 90% of the selective hunting of this species throughout this range. All right, thanks Shai. And Sonia has a follow-up question to that is, do the transmitters have any effect in their breeding behavior? 
in case of selection of mates in the wild? So uh, we believe that, uh, so the answer is no, since means no, we believe that, uh, I mean, the, in the water, so turtles can go in a different, if you, if you see the turtle breeding, so they can use water, they can, I mean, males can go under rather than means no, always coming up. So they can just like, they need to just rub the cloaca so they can go under, under the female and stuff like that. And this is like only the standard way how you can put a transmitter. So I think that this should be okay. And right now we are not really, really worried about the breeding, but we need to understand that mention about their conservation requirement and and uh, and the survival and dispersal rather than means so, I mean definitely means the eventual goal is that they should be breeding, but right now this critical information is equally important for us. Thank you, Shai. Next question, Ken asks. Are there any assurance countries in, uh, excuse me, assurance colonies in countries outside of their home range? So yes, so Madras Crocodile Bank had two females and they, a few years back, they flew a male from Vienna Zoo and they have been breeding this species for last several years. So they have a good number of animals there, yes. Okay, thank and you. And also, uh, also Austria Zoo, yes. Right. So you have the, the two primary assurance colonies are in Bangladesh and India within their core range. And then you have um, a couple other supplementary assurance colonies for the species. So then Rajib asks, for how long can the transmitters continue to send signals? So we believe that means you know, at least turtles need to be there on the surface for at least a minute, a little bit more than that. So this is how like, you know, so then that, that I mean, transmitters should get the signal from that. And then how long I think do the actual transmitters last? So how long it's going to be on the turtle itself? Correct. How, how long will the uh, the battery of the transmitter last so that it continues? Okay. To oh, send sorry. Signal? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that 18 to 24 months, depending that how frequently they surface. So if they are going to surface, battery is going to definitely be consumed. So more coordinates means there's a more battery consumption. That means less life of the transmitter. But if like everything is ideal for everyone, so probably like means no more than 18 months somewhere but not more than 24 months, yes. Okay, thank you. And then uh, Marav asks, can we pray for the turtles? Yes, we all are praying. That's why we are all here right now talking about turtles. So thank you for your time, yes. Thank you, and I, Marav sent a uh, follow-up question. How, how can I participate in the TSA? And I know they just sent me an email, so I will actually uh, respond to that and include you in that. So our yeah. next question comes from um, Iramana um, from Indonesia. Uh, Iramana says, what a great achievement, Shai and team. I have questions. Number one, what are the biggest challenges during rearing of the young turtles? So we'll start there. So uh, the biggest challenges, I would say that means when the figuring out the diet, since you know the everything was like to start with, we did not know much. So what diet they prefer, and then also like so there's a short winters in that area in the coastal eastern coastal area. So then in during the salt, especially during the salt winters, when turtles start getting sick and uh, sometime like you know they need a special care and so things like that. Uh, so that was like kind of a husbandry related things. And also we did not know much, much about the eco tolerance that what kind of salinity they preferred when they're in the wild system. But like in last 10 years, we got a like, you know, hand on that. So we know more than like when we started. So mainly the husbandry challenges. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second question is what kind of diseases do you see, do you screen for in pre-release assessments? 
So uh, we uh, did not see any disease per se, but most of the animals, when they were just like found all active and they were all eating in the system. So before that, before selecting them, we observed them and we also did like little bit writing exercise when they are fit. And also we just like tested them with the mycoplasma, for the mycoplasma and also, uh, you know, with other things. Uh, so yeah, like herpes virus and, you know, so basic things. So we made sure that they are not carrying any disease back in the wild. Okay, thank you. And then the last question by Irman, uh, excuse me if I pronounce this incorrectly, but uh, Iraman uh, is, what is the sex ratio of the animals released? Is there any specific considerations or concerns taken towards that? Thank you. Yes, so uh, I mean, right now we, uh, I mean, we have, some males in our facilities, those were born in from in 2012 and 13 and 14. So this like, you know, these two batches, 2012 and 13, we thought it's like fit for the release. And uh, in this release, we use three males and seven females for now. But we believe that one male per three female is like good enough sex ratio to be released back in the wild, as well as like keep them for their students colonies. Yeah. Okay, great. And then the next question comes from our colleague, Pelf, who of course works with Batagur as well in uh, Malaysia, is Shai, when you say thorough health assessments, what do you do? Is there blood work, physical assessments, anything in particular that you're looking for? And I think some of that was answered just a minute ago, but you might have yeah. some more direction for Pelf. Yeah, so PELF, uh, we just like, you know, so in, I mean, you can, since as a turtle biologist, you know that which turtle is sick and which is not, which is underweight or which is not. So we just like carefully monitor the weight that if they are like, I mean, kind of a stable weight or gaining weight. So we thought that this is, and their particular turtles were active. I mean, we had 20 animals to select 10. So that, that was the reason we shifted uh, more than uh, more animals to the softly side than we wanted to release. So that is the reason that if they are like, means no less weight or anything. And we did like little physical exams, like writing exercise. So if you flip a turtle, they are just going to be right like quickly. So that's another thing. And we also did uh, some of the blood work. And also, I mean, since there was some concerns about the herpes virus before uh, from a lab. So we tested that. We did some mycoplasma work and things like that. So, yeah. I can send you the entire uh, this thing if you are interested. I can just like send separately to you. And then Pelf also notes that uh, just like Batiger borneoensis, the painted terrapin, Batiger basca can tolerate salinity. So they are a halo tolerant species living in the estuaries. Do you want to kind of explain some of that to everyone watching the? physiology and salt tolerance and salt preferences of these turtles. Because if you look at those, um, those maps of the turtles movements, you can see that um, like Kali, she went pretty far out into the Bay of Bengal, which is uh, pure seawater. So uh, generally what we do, so we believe that uh, you know, so first few years, we could keep all our animals in fresh water. It's not, not like really, really fresh water, but most of the sources are like from this rain water. So, I mean, uh, early years, they are like, you know, from two to four PPT salinity. And as they grow, we just like shift, to, uh, shift them to a like kind of a higher uh, salinity and you know, higher concentration of salt. So the area, the soft fleece enclosure you just saw that has like eight to 10 PPT salinity. But in the wild, I mean, that, that has the salinity gradient that's like everywhere, like temperature gradient and depth gradient. So we believe that uh, they use various salinity gradients and they, they are going to be okay anywhere between two to 10 salinity gradients. But this is like our understanding that they do very well, but they also do well in the fresh water systems. And that is the reason we like to start with, we used only the fresh water sources to rear them. But later we moved. And right now in the phase two, we are going to use the different, uh, different salinity gradients and rear and uh, probably compare that with the health, overall health, as well as like, you know, uh, growth and things like that. 
so we know more but uh, i believe that uh, anything like below 10 salinity is good for them uh, to survive and thrive yeah. okay thanks next question from rick is at what age do the released turtles reproduce so we believe that, uh, I mean, uh, like any other Batagos, they are going to take at least a couple of more years. So I would say that four to five years. And so total for the, especially for the females, I think that 14 to 15 years, the age of maturity. And that is the reason we need to keep all our nesting bags intact before that. So again, in the vision plan, we identified that, but I think that they will take another five years. Okay, thanks. And actually, this question from Rajiv kind of ties in the age of sexual maturity and the vision plan. So Rajiv asks, at what number um, in the wild do you think the turtles can breed naturally and be self-sustaining? Do you have a, you know, do you have a, a, a standard level that you're plan to get to, especially regarding the dispersal of these animals, that you feel uh, the turtles can start to become a self-sustaining population. Of course, given all the threats that they're under in the wild. Right. So Raju, it's a very good question and we have been contemplating on that, but I guess that, I mean, that's a very ambitious plan, as I said, but in next 10 years, we want to make more and more turtles, definitely with all the scientifically backed uh, you know, programs and, and components, but we want to put more than 300 turtles back in the wild in the next 10 years. And we believe that uh, that that number will definitely help. And that means the no end point is to see that when the next females will emerge to nest on Mechua or any other island, I mean, any other sand beaches they used, uh, I mean, 25 or 30 years back. Okay, thank you. Next question from Marav is, I've seen people in West Bengal where turtles are sold in the markets for food. And I know you and I both know that um, this is heavily um, the soft shells, especially uh, Lissemi's punctata being consumed in the markets of West Bengal. Are there any uh, surveys uh, by TSA or the Forest Department or Wildlife Control Bureau to look specifically for Batagurbaska in the markets there? So actually I did uh, some of those surveys uh, in 2008 and nine, I already mentioned that. And there I found lots of soft cell, but I did not find any Batagurbaska in India or any other like Batagurs who say, I mean, Kachuga or, I once found a Batagur Dangoka in one of those markets, probably that was, I mean, traded from Northern India or something like that. But yes, indeed, there are lots of soft cell turtles are ending and especially again from Northern India. And that's like matter of concern. And there was Operation Kurma by, by Wildlife Control Bureau of India, which ended in 2018. And that confiscated more than 15,000 turtles. So, uh, I mean, TSA does not do lots of enforcement, but other organizations like Wildlife Conservation Society of India, they have the whole CWT program, as well as like, you know, West Bengal uh, Forest Department, as well as like Wildlife Crime Control Bureau, uh, their Eastern India office, which is based in Kolkata. They have been doing lots of work and they have been cracking all those uh, trade and trade network and they've been busting the markets. But uh, we play a role when they confiscate animal and hand over th them to us. So yeah, I mean, there are lots of information is generated by other organizations. Those are main, mainly like trying to combat the wildlife trade. But we take care of the animals, those are handed over to us and with other uh, technical things like identification and classification and then triage and how to keep them and where to, how to repatriate them and things like that. So right now, uh, that's what we do. Okay. Um, this is a good question from Mike Bishop having to do with the turtles habits um, and metabolism is how many hours a day do uh, they, Batagur Basca, sun compared to swimming and foraging? So we believe that means no uh, uh, turtles are like, they are like cows. I mean, they just like graze, they have been grazing, like w w whatever we see in the captivity. So, I mean, whole day they have been just trying to find something to eat. So I believe that, uh, yeah. So I would say at least like 
somewhere between 50 50 so most of the time they spend just to look for food yeah i mean we released the animal as soon as they were released in couple of hours we went back and we saw them like looking for some food and any 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 leaves so i think at the edge of the river so i believe that they need to eat a lot of food too you know okay great and then david asks how much does each satellite transmitter weigh so uh, with all the, the attachment and epoxy and everything, the net, everything, so somewhere between 300 to 350 grams. And turtles were like eight to 10 kilograms, eight kilogram males and 10 kilogram females. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the last question here in the Q&A, and then I know I have a question of my own, but is from Shannon and Shannon asks, are you concerned with genetic bottlenecking at all? Of course, with regard to the fact that the assurance colonies come from a relatively small amount of founder individuals. Yes, so we are really concerned, but since we were in a firefighting mode, so we could not do much since everyone just like needed to be slightly comfortable with the situation. So in the phase two, we identified that is a major component of like actually, so that is the reason we uh, don't call our colonies as assurance colony right now. So it's like just breeding colony and we are trying to create conservation colony, but it's a, one of the major critical component in second phase of the project where we are going to do genetics of all 370 specimens we are having right now. So thank you. All right, great, thank you. So a question I have that I didn't see anyone ask is, why do you believe that the turtles disperse so greatly and with intense effort following release, as of course depicted by the satellite imagery? I, I think it's like kind of a, due to a variety of factors and probably like, you know, due to the different drivers. So since they were all born in the captive situation, so they maybe exploring different areas and maybe looking for food. And that is the reason they were going down. It could be current, but like uh, some turtles also moved up. So two turtles, those were released. They were moved up about like 30 to 40, 35 kilometers from that area. So I think that they, they just, they are just like curious and they're exploring the good, good areas to forage and then to settle down. And probably that is also contributed uh, by the current of the under undercurrent of the water. So yeah, but it's really heartening to see that how they are just like going in the sea and then coming back up. So it's not like they are just like being washed away. So they have that kind of strength and muscle tone to come back and you know explore the variety of a variety of like you know uh, tidal creeks and the mangroves as well as the sea. So. That's very heartening to see, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think, you know, th the main thing also, uh, another takeaway is the head starting is um, not new to the conservation, but it's constantly evolving. And in many cases, you have to look at it on a species by species basis. And for these large riverine or estuarine turtles, uh, who have lived and been reared in captivity for the duration of their lifetime, those captive settings are all that they know. And so following release, they're very much going to explore the bounds of the natural habitat until they're able to settle down into what they consider to be their home range with variable factors in that. I know we, we see them going into Bangladesh and out into the Bay of Bengal and then coming back up and into the Raimangal River and Hubli River. Um, so I think that's also a big part of it. Um, really quick, so if the turtles disperse so widely across this vast expanse, as has been demonstrated, what is the long-term plan to help ensure that release turtles meet as adults or meet other wild Badiger Basca for successful breeding? So there are two things. So when we uh, did the habitat evaluation in 2014, so we met lots of fishermen and they confirmed that there are presence of the males in certain areas of Sundarbans. And I already mentioned that means you know, a few years back, uh, Bangladesh team found at least two juveniles. So 
there are certain individuals and that is the reason we wrote that MPCS plan where we need to, as soon as we have more information in hand on the survival and dispersal, we are going to pump more and more animals back in the wild. And the same time, uh, uh, I mean, Bangladesh program is going to do the same. And we are also going to be connected with the assurance colony, those falls outside of the natural range to, you know, also, uh, you know, give us some animals to be released back. So we believe that also, but there's another challenge is that we also need to find a freshwater source coming in directly to the sea. That is their main habitat as what I understand. So we are also in dialogue with, uh, lots of authorities that how we can use no man's land between India and uh, Bangladesh, which is essentially Raimangal River, so really, really large freshwater source coming from Bangladesh and going to the sea. So how we can use that as a kind of a common site for both India and Bangladesh program and probably recover the species, which has definitely has less fishing pressure and all kind of salinity gradients. So, I mean, some of the common sites, if we, uh, I mean, if we zero down and 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 probably address as part of the joint uh, binational program. So I think that turtles are going to start meeting each other in a few years time. So, yeah. Okay, great answer. So my final question for this TSA webinar experience is something, an answer that I know you know and I know, but to share with everyone is just, why is this work so important? So uh, I think that, uh, I mean, uh, as Turtle Survival Alliance, I think that, you know, that's our duty to, you know, save this species and that send a message. So whatever learning and conservation coming from this species, so uh, that is going to definitely help other species. So all 29 species at some point, I mean, 70 or 19 of them are endangered or critically endangered. So learning from this species is going to help other species definitely. And this species is deeply embedded with the culture and uh, folklore of you know, the, the entire Sundarbans. So definitely we need to conserve this species and demonstrate to the various stakeholders and partners that how the species recovery can work. And that would, I would definitely use that as a model success story to not only conserve turtles, but other threatened Indian wildlife uh, among the various stakeholders. All right, great. Thank you so much, Shai. This has been a great webinar. I hope everybody was able to take away something from this. There's lots of great comments in the chat just talking about how inspirational this is and what a great work uh, your, your team and yourself and everyone affiliated with this project has done. And I know we're all just excited to see what the future holds. This is, you know, this project is restoring a piece of the identity of the Sunderbonds, just like with the tigers and the yes. deer <laughs> and the crocodiles. Um, you know, this is an iconic turtle of the Sunderbonds. And uh, what, what you and your team are doing is, is a, it's historic. Um, and so I wanna say thank you. I want to say thank you to everyone who has joined today. We have many other webinars that are coming up in the next couple months, especially during TSA's Turtle Month from April 22nd, starting on um, Earth Day, all the way through May 23rd, World Turtle Day. We will have numerous webinars in which I hope you join. And if you would like to ask any follow-up questions uh, now that our webinar experience is coming to a close. Please don't hesitate to contact Shai at sure. shy at turtlesurvival.org. Um, or you can contact, if you forget that, info at turtlesurvival.org. And you can always go to our website if you happen to forget any of those. But uh, please um, join us for our next webinar. Shai, thank you so much. And thank you, Jordan. See you all again you. soon. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for joining and talking about turtles. Yeah. All right. Take care. Thanks so much. Thank you.